And today we're going to talk about the MAC sublayer. Layer 2 of the OSI model talks about point-to-point -point connection through a physical link. However, in many cases, the data recommunication is done through a shared medium. For example, in Wi-Fi networks, multiple laptops can talk together to each other or to an access point. In the Ethernet standard, just until a few years ago, information was also uh, using a shared medium uh, in rates below 100 megabit per second. This was the 10 megabit per second and 1 megabit per second Ethernet. So here we want to explore how these protocols are designed. When multiple users share the same medium with some capacity, say C, the easiest way to make it work is to allocate each user its own share of the capacity. For example, C over N of the capacity. So each user can use his share of the channel regardless of the activity of other users. This can be done, for example, in frequency division multiplexing, where each user is allocated its own frequency. Or in time division multiplexing, where the time is divided into slots and each user has its own allocated time slots. Static allocation is simple, but not very efficient. For example, if only a few of the users are active in most of the times, most of the capacity is wasted. Another problem is that since each user is using only a fraction of the channel capacity, each frame transmission takes n times longer. Thus, we better use all the capacity at, one, at once as a one channel, and then we need to solve the problem of dynamically allocating the channel to the users. This is exactly why we have the medium access protocols. A media access control or MAC protocol can be divided into several classes. First are those where conflicts cannot occur. Of course, we can have static allocation like we described before with TDMA, FDMA, and CDMA. Or we can have some kind of a dynamic allocation where there's, say, a token that passes between the different users and only a user that holds the token can transmit, thus no collision can occur. Another way to do dynamic allocation is through a reservation mechanism. All these are used in protocols. However, in this talk, we're going to concentrate on contention protocol. These are protocols where collision between transmission can occur, but we have to solve them. The simplest of the collision resolution protocol is the HALOA protocol designed at the University of Hawaii in the 70s. Basically, the protocol is very simple. When a frame arrives for transmission, the station, the user, simply transmits the frame and waits for an acknowledgement. If an acknowledgement arrived, we're done. We know that the transmission of the packet or of the frame was successful. Otherwise, we wait a random time and go to one, namely transmit again. Note that if two users transmit at the same time, their transmission overlaps, both transmissions are gobbled, and none of the users is going to get an acknowledgement for its transmission. In this diagram, we see an example of how Aloha is working. Time is flowing this way, and each rectangle represents a transmission of a frame where the left end is the transmission of the first bit and the right end is the last reception of the reception of the last bit. So what you can see here is five users using the same channel. User E is transmitting successfully its first frame. And then users D and C transmit with an overlapping period. So both their frames are collided and we have multiple colli collisions here. And then each, if, each, in, if each of these users is uh, picking a random time for retransmission. And as you can see, user E was successful, and then D and C. And while the A and B are still trying to find, uh, uh, transmit their own colliding frame, user E managed to transmit a third frame uh, in between uh, 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 other user frames. So what we can see here is um, that things, these things can work, However, 
bandwidth is not necessarily uh, allocated fairly among the users because as you can see here, user E managed to transmit three frames before user A managed to transmit even one. So think of uh, constant size frames. All frames are size T. So if my red frame is transmitted starting at time T0, it will be successful if nobody is going to transmit while I'm transmitting, but also if nobody is going to start transmitting up to T time units before I started transmitting, as, because then I will collide with the tail of its transmission. So we have a sensitive period of around of two T times. Using this uh, uh, observation, we can calculate the throughput and see that the maximum achievable throughput in an NLO protocol is only 18% of the capacity. Okay. 18% throughput is really low. So people came out with an improvement for their law called slotted law. The idea here is the time is divided into frame size slots and transmission can only start at the beginning of a slot. This means that all the frames that are scheduled to be transmitted at some time during the previous slot will actually transmit at the beginning of the next slot. This simple change increased the maximum throughput of ALOA from 18% to 36%. This is because the sensitivity period now decreased from 2T to T. However, this requires us to synchronize the user to the to the beginning of the slots, which is not always a simple task. The allow protocols are not very polite. A user does not listen to the channel before it starts talking. This is why we get such low throughput. CSMA protocols improve this by forcing the user to first sense the channel and see that it is idle before it starts transmitting. So here times is not slotted and we listen to the channel before transmission and transmit only if it is silent. The question is, what happens if the channel is busy? In this case, we have three different persistent models. In one persistent CSMA, we wait until the channel become idle and then immediately transmit. In case of a collision, because maybe two users were waiting for the channel to become idle, then we wait a random time and listen again. In non-persistent CSMA, we wait a random amount of time and try to listen to the channel again. If it is idle, we transmit. If it's occupied, we wait another random time. And then, of course, there's P-persistent CSMA, where we wait until the channel becomes idle and transmit with some probability P, and with probability 1 minus P, we wait a random time and listen again. While CSMA protocols drastically decrease the number of collisions, collision can still occur. Of course, in one persistent, but also in P persistent with probability P, if two users are waiting for the end of the transmission, they will collide. But in all variants of CSMA, collision can still occur because when a user sends the channel to be idle, it doesn't really mean that the channel is idle. What you can see here is that some user, the user above, is trans start transmitting the first bit. However, this transmission needs to propagate through the network and it doesn't happen in zero time. And if after the precision started, but before the signal reached me, I sense the channel, I will start transmission too and a collision will occur. To understand the typical propagation time, let's look at two examples. First, the 10 megabit per second Ethernet cable. In Ethernet, a cable can be up to 500 meters, and up to five of them can be connected with repeaters to form a medium of length two and a half kilometers. The delay from end to end in this medium is 25 microseconds. And in this time, at 10 megabit per second, we can transmit 32 bytes. So only after 32 bytes are transmitted, the other end of the cable starts hearing the transmission. In Wi-Fi nowadays, we're using ranges of up to 230 meters, and the delay using the speed of light is about three quarters of a microsecond. 
it's 300 megabit per second, but I can transmit 28 bytes before the other end of the range uh, will receive the first bit. So when we look at CSMA performance, it of course depends on the ratio between tau, the propagation delay, and t, the frame size. We call it A. For A equal 1, we get a lower performance, of course, because we save nothing by uh, sensing the channel. However, what you can see here in a, uh, in a graph for non-persistent CSMA, as A becomes smaller and smaller, our maximum performance increases. So for A 100s, you can see that performance can reach almost 80% of the capacity. And this is typical in the cases we showed before. So CSMA improves a lot since we listened before transmitting. CSMA CD, CD is for collision detection, improves CSMA since the station listens to the channel while it transmits and stops transmitting if, the, if it detects a collision. So we don't waste the entire frame length when a collision occurs. This requires special hardware that is not always implementable. So in, in some protocols, we use just CSMA. Due to commercial reasons, sometimes CSMA does is called CSMA CA for collision avoidance. Here too, we can play with uh, all kinds of persistent and, uh, models like in CSMA and uh, with uh, slotted time to improve performance. But this is beyond the scope of this talk. So how long will it take a user to detect a collision in CSMA CD in the worst case? We already showed that from the transmission of the first bit till the time it is received at the other end of the network, it can take up to tau time units. So a user can start transmission just before this. However, for the first user to detect that somebody else is transmitting, we need to wait another tau units for each signal to reach the first user. So all in all, we need to wait two tau units. Ethernet, or IEEE 802.3, is maybe the most famous CSMA CD protocol. It, it is used one persistent, and we already showed that in the old 10 megabit per second Ethernet, one can transmit 32 bytes in time tau. So in order for CSMA CD to work, we need to wait two tau before we know that the packet is not garbled. This is why the minimum size frame in Ethernet was set to 64 bytes, which is the number of bytes you need to transmit to reach 2 tau time limits. Another thing that is used in Ethernet is a binary exponential backoff. When a collision occurs, we first uh, randomly wait either 1 or 0 time unit, where a time unit is 2 tau. After I successive collision, we randomly wait a time in the range of 0 to 2 to the power of i minus 1. So first collision, we either wait 1 or 0, second collision, 0, 1, 2, or 3, and so forth. i can grow up to 10. After 10 successive collision, we don't grow i anymore, and we allow up to success, 16 successive collision before we drop the frame and give up. IEEE 802.11 is the standard used in Wi-Fi networks. The standard defines three access met method. The mandatory one using CSMA CD, as we described before. The other one is using a version of CSMA CD with request to send and clear to send signals, as I will explain shortly. And then there's an optional polling mode where the access point polls the terminal according to some list. In the CSMA version of 802.11, the user senses the channel for an amount of time called diffs and then send its data. The destination wait a short amount of time called sifs and then sends an arc. If the channel is busy, there's a binary backoff, just like in Ethernet. However, all, all other stations that here the users start transmitting differ from accessing the network for a period called NAV. The reason for this is that 
another station may not hear uh, the acknowledgement of the destination and interfere with it, and we want to clear the channel for the acknowledgement message. This will be clear, become clearer in the next slides. So, to detect that the channel is idle, a user is waiting diffs amount of time. But since we don't want to have collisions like in one persistent CSMA, each user then waits a random number of slots before it starts transmission. This will avoid many collisions. However, if every time I'm listening to the uh, diff period of time and I'm losing the collision, I have to redraw the amount of time I'm waiting, it will cause some fairness issue. So a user remembers the countdown of the number of slots it, it needs to wait, and next time it senses the channel to be idle, it continues the countdown from where it stops. This way, no single user is keep waiting and losing the competition to other users. Next, we're going to discuss the hidden terminal problem. I put it here four stations, A, B, C, and D, and A and C, both A and C want to transmit, and what you see here is their transmission radius. So A wants to transmit to B, and B is within its transmission radius. C wants to transmit to D, and it is also within its transmission radius. So is B. However, A and C cannot hear each other. What happens is that, suppose that A senses the channel, see that it is not occupied and start transmission to B. Now C comes in, senses the channel, since it cannot hear A, it sees that it is clear and starts transmitting to D. What's going to happen is that B would not be able to uh, understand A's transmission because C acts as a noise which disturbs reception. This is called the hidden terminal problem, and the next operation mode of 802.11 try to solve this problem. The 802.11 virtual channel sensing mode comes to solve the hidden terminal problem. When, a, when terminal A sends the channel to be idle, it starts transmitting an RTS, request to send signal. This is a short signal that tells everybody I captured the channel. B, the destination, hear the request to send, and send a clear to send signal, meaning I don't hear any other transmission, you can please go ahead. Because we can have a situation where some hidden terminal, say D, is transmitting and A cannot uh, listen to it, cannot uh, hear it. After receiving clear to send, A starts transmitting the data. Notice that now, since C and D both got the request to send, either the request to send or the clear to send, they refrain from using the channel for a period called LAV, or Network Allocation Vector. Thus, A is assured that no hidden terminal can disturb its data transmission to B, solving this important problem. In this talk, we covered the basics of media access protocol and showed two examples of common protocols. There are many, many other uh, uh, protocols built on the same principles which you can explore by yourself.